Hey there, and welcome back to Crazy Uncle Fleek's How To Series, part two of how to bike with your Vishla or other pointer breed. I will reiterate again, don't know how this would work with uh, other breeds, um, but hounds, dogs that chase things primarily, this is not gonna be a good system for them. So I just wanna reiterate that. If you have a Vishla or other type of pointer, it should work fine for you. Crazy Uncle Fleek, do a quick wrap up of that. Fleek, it's my last name, has nothing to do with the slang phrase. Uncle, don't have any kids, so here I am passing on all my knowledge to the YouTube world that I would otherwise pass on to my progeny. And crazy, well, at some point, let's see, I'm a little bit crazy. So let's go ahead and jump in. So first and foremost, if you're going biking, you need to take the proper safety precautions for yourself. Always wear a helmet on your bike, have a forward facing strobe light, a rear facing red flashing light. Always wear high visibility yellow. And lastly, this is my pet peeve, do not wear headphones, especially while you're biking with a dog. You need to be able to hear what's going on all around you. You need to be able to hear dogs, cars, etc. Uh, people telling you that they're coming up behind you if you're on a biking trail. So do not wear headphones while you're biking with your dog. It is just too dangerous. So two very important points about your specific dog. First and foremost is young dogs. If you are biking with a dog that is under a year old, you want to try and keep that dog as much as possible running primarily on grass and dirt, so soft surfaces. Now, uh, when I first got Rogers, uh, I read a lot of things online that said, especially with big dogs, you should not let them run more than a mile or two each day uh, as their bones are developing, that it can be dangerous for them. So I got in touch with my breeder and she made a very good point, which I will share with you, which is uh, these dogs are bred to run. So the idea that they're not going to run more than a mile or two a day before they're, uh, or until after they're a year old is kind of absurd. But she did point out is they're not designed biologically to run on concrete. They are built over millions of years of evolution to run on soft surfaces. So uh, keep them when they are younger running primarily on grass and dirt. Now, Raj tends to choose his own uh, surface. Uh, when we're running, if it's wet or mucky, a lot of times he will choose to run on the pavement. Uh, one thing I've noticed is that he tends to run a little slower when he's doing that. So. Um, Pay attention to the dog. Uh, don't need to be crazy and not letting them run at all on concrete, but minimize the amount that they are running on concrete when they're under a year old. And then another point uh, regarding the dog's health that was pointed out to me actually by a veterinarian that saw me biking with Rogers one day is that if your dog is not accustomed to heavy aerobic exercise, don't start biking with them long distances right away. What I mean by that is if up until now you've only been doing 20 minute walks or even hour long walks where you're going maybe a mile or two and they're not really running much, don't jump on the bike and bike 50 miles with them. Uh, now, if they've been running uh, with you say, and you've been doing five, seven, 10 miles running, sure, you can get on the bike and go 15, 20 miles because they're more accustomed to that aerobic exercise. But just like humans, dogs need to get accustomed to aerobic exercise. So uh, if that vet out there that stopped me ever watches this, thank you so much for that. It was something that I had not thought of uh, and I wanna share with you. So ease into it if your dog has not had a ton of aerobic exercise uh, up until the point you start biking with them. Uh, just those two notes about the health and safety of your dog as well. 
Now jumping into the process of the actual biking. First things first, I mentioned this in part one, but I'm gonna reiterate it here again. Your safety is number one. Your dog's safety is 1A. Uh, now, some people might flip that and want to put their dog's safety ahead of their safety. And while philosophically that sounds good, here's the problem with that. You can't look after your dog's safety if you're on your butt with a broken leg or a broken head or a broken arm because you weren't looking out for your safety first. So the best way that you can protect your dog is by protecting yourself. So always keep yourself upright so that you can better protect your dog. Now, if that means just momentarily that you have to focus on your safety over the dog's safety, that's okay. But just remember, you need to stay upright even if it's a situation that you think is relatively dangerous for the dog, uh, it's not going to help if in the end you break quickly uh, and with your hand off the handlebar or you know, making some crazy turn and you end up flipping over your handlebars. Then the dog is in danger and you're hurt. So always have your safety and you remaining upright be your number one concern and that will allow you to put the dog's safety as just a very close one egg. Now this is a very fine distinction but it's one that needs to be made and that is when you go biking with your dog always remember that you are biking for your dog. Now what do I mean by that? What I mean by that is when you're going biking, the dog needs to be in charge. So if you're actually biking because you have some exercise goal in mind for you, so you want to burn a certain amount of calories or you want to hit a certain heart rate, you, whether you realize it or not, are going to be putting the dog's well-being second to your goal. So here's how I deal with it. I always go biking with Rogers for Rogers first. And then when I'm done, I'll come back and a lot of times I will have gotten enough exercise and I'll be done for the day. Sometimes I haven't gotten enough exercise. So what I'll do then, I'll put him away, jump back on the bike, go off biking by myself for myself. So always remember that when you are biking with your dog, you are biking for your dog. Uh, so that leads directly into the next point, which is when you're biking for your dog, you let them set the speed, okay? And while you're on the bike, your goal is to keep them within the space from the end of your front tire to the back of your back tire, okay? So if they speed up, you need to speed up. If they slow down, you need to slow down. If they stop, you stop. Now, one exception to that is if they stop in an area where it's dangerous for them to stop, obviously then you need to get them uh, out of the way, okay? Or if they're running into some kind of danger, then obviously you need to stop them from doing that. But as you are out just generally biking along, you want to let them set the speed and match their speed, okay? Now, the reason why I call this zone on the end of the front tire to the back of the back tire uh, to be very important is as long as you keep them there it's almost impossible for them physically to get across you and uh, into any kind of danger if there's any danger over here okay so it just limits your world of danger to one side okay also if the dog gets ahead of you and does go across what is going to happen is this leash is going to end up getting caught either in your front tire or in your front brake very, very bad. Or, as happened with me early on when I used to carry the carabiner in my hand, it he went off in front of me and it actually caught on my brake and uh, pulled my handlebars like that and I went head first over my handlebars. So. Uh, same thing with the back, uh, if he gets too far behind you, the leash is going to 
get potentially caught in your back tire or your back brakes, and that also can be uh, slightly less dangerous, but uh, not as bad as, uh, but still bad. <laughs> so one little aside on that point, when I was first starting to bike with Rogers, a lot of times he would lag behind or be consistently out in front of me. And eventually what I learned was that when he did that, I would just have to stop. Uh, stop, bring him back to being beside me and let him know that he needed to stay next to me. And if he didn't, that we weren't going to continue. And uh, that seemed to reinforce to him understanding that he needed to stay next to me at as much as possible. Now, are there times where he still does get a little ahead or behind? Absolutely, but not nearly as much as uh, he did early on. So as you're starting out, if they're consistently getting out ahead of you or lagging behind, and with pointers especially, their instinct is to wanna to be out ahead of you, uh, draw the line, stop, make sure you use your verbal command for bringing them back to beside you, which we'll talk about later, um, and make sure they understand that they need to be there and uh, we're not going to continue until they do that. So one of the most important things to know when you're out biking with your dog is where your attention needs to be focused. And really, it needs to be focused just about everywhere. And what I mean by that is I use the analogy of thinking about it the way a fighter pilot thinks about her environment. Uh, and that is that they're constantly scanning all around to see if there are any dangers. And uh, this is exactly the same when you're biking. You need to be uh, out there as far as you can see, looking at each individual thing and trying to figure out, is that going to be a danger? Is that going to be what I call an obstacle for the dog? So what are those obstacles? Uh, people, other dogs, I see huge obstacles. Rogers is super friendly, so he always wants to interact with other dogs. Uh, trees, rocks, uh, vehicles, if you're anywhere where there are vehicles around. Um, any kind of food is another one. If there's somebody sitting along the side of the path having a picnic, that can be a huge obstacle for a dog. Uh, so really just need to have your attention as far out as uh, you can, scanning uh, both in front and behind and making sure that you're aware of everything that's approaching so that uh, as that obstacle comes near, you can make a decision as to what level do I need to potentially control my dog or, or potentially not uh, if it's a lower grade obstacle. Uh, one area where it tends to be kind of difficult is sometimes you're biking along a sidewalk and maybe that you can't see like the other side of a group of cars. If you're on a sidewalk and there are cars parked on the street to your left, maybe someone's coming across the street with a dog and you can see their head, but you can't see the dog. So there's little things like that that you just need to start to be aware of because you're moving faster than when you're walking and probably used to you know, being prepared for those kinds of things uh, in a normal environment. But when you're moving faster, those things creep up on you quite a bit quicker. So you always need to be looking out ahead of you uh, like I mentioned, similar to a fighter pilot, or when you're driving a car, you're on the freeway, you're looking much further out in the distance for danger than if you were driving in the city. So think of it that way. You want to have your radar a good distance out to make sure that you are uh, taking into account all of the potential dangers out there. So you're out there biking, you've got your radar up, the dog is next to you. Next point is that you want to keep both of your hands on the handlebars as much as you can, especially when you're going at speed. The reason for that is that if the dog does decide to stop and you don't have time to react and the uh, leash and carabiner are going to pop off, uh, you have to have both hands on the handlebars 
handlebars in order to keep control. If you only have one hand on it, even just this slight tug that pops this off uh, could potentially make you lose balance. Uh, the most important thing while you're moving quickly is that you have control of your front wheel. If you lose control of your front wheel, bad things are going to happen. Trust me, I figured this system out through trial and error, and that's why I want to pass it on to others. Uh, cannot have your hand off your handlebar if you're moving at speed. You have to have them both on. Again, this is part of that rule. You have to stay upright in order to protect your dog. So even though you might think, hey, I've got to grab them and try and control them, it is way better for you to have the uh, um, leash pop off and, and then slow down on your own accord and come back and get the dog then for you to try to do it fail and go head first or sideways off your bike hurt yourself and then not be able to control your dog at all okay all right so you're biking along you've got your radar up your dog is next to you you've got both hands on your handlebar you're moving at speed and you see something that you think is going to potentially be an obstacle. Now, whether it actually becomes an obstacle or not, you need to slow down. Um, so, uh, and this leads directly into my next point, which is and because you have both of your hands on the handlebar, um, you then are able to slow down using your right hand. Now, why is that important? Your right hand is your back brake. Your left hand is your front brake. So let me give you a quick example of a mistake I made and why I'm making this point. So you're moving along at speed, the dog next to you, you see a danger and instinctively you go to grab for the leash and clamp down on your left brake. Your front tire locks up and because you don't have your balance correct, you go head first over your handlebars. I've done it at least three or four times. Do not want to do that. And that is why you have to have that radar up at distance. You slow down when you see any potential danger, any potential obstacle, so that you then can be going slow enough to take your right hand off of the handlebar and control the dog. Uh, we'll talk about um, methods of controlling the dog in just a minute, but that is the process. You want to do the majority of your braking, especially going at speed with your right hand before you reach to control the dog, okay? So when you go to control the dog, how should you do it? Well, there are three main methods that I use, and I kind of do it depending on whether I think the obstacle is uh, low risk, medium risk, or high risk. So let's say, for example, I see that there's a dog on a parallel path that's 20 yards away, and the dog looks to be reasonably under control. I'd say that's probably a low threat. So what I will do in that case is I'll just simply reach down and put my hand underneath the ribbon leash like this. Okay, so what that does, first of all, is that lets the dog know that I've got him under control or that I've got some level of control over him. And he will usually then come back towards me if he's not right next to me. Um, but it just lets me know that uh, as I've you know, slowed down, I now have a reasonable amount of control. So we get up next to it, that dog doesn't do anything, my dog doesn't react in any way because that dog's not doing anything, and I can simply let go, put my hand back on the handlebar and accelerate. If I think it's a medium risk, I'll do essentially the same thing, except what I'll do is I'll grab this and I'll just wrap my hand around it once. Um, that way, I have a better pull on the dog, uh, and I can actually restrain him very quickly if something does happen. So let's say it's that same situation, except it's a path that's directly parallel, so the dog's only a few feet away. I would probably then go for the wrap 
method on that if that dog looks like he's not, uh, you know, hopping around or really alert or really, you know, focusing in on me and Rogers. Um, if that is the case, then I am absolutely going to go to where I consider my high obstacle control, and that is grabbing the actual leash and putting my finger on the stop so I have control of the whole leash and control of the whole dog by using the handle to the leash. Okay? So those are the three options for control. Uh, and again, after you've slowed down a bit, it's perfectly fine to take your hand off the handlebar and control the dog. So now just a few tidbits of information that uh, I have figured out that I thought would be good to share with you as you're learning to bike with your dog. Uh, the first of those is turns. Uh, and now, if you're on a path where there aren't any turns, uh, especially when you're starting out, you may not encounter one until you start to branch out a little bit as to where you bike with your dog. So it may act kind of sneak up on you and that's why I wanted to be sure to mention this so when you encounter it the first time you can have this in mind. Now right turns and left turns are exactly opposite so if you're making a right turn the issue is that the dog has a shorter distance to travel and will often cut the corner and end up ahead of you so you may need to go a little faster or you need to make uh, ask the dog to slow down. Uh, I tend to do both, uh, so I try to go a little bit faster, and I also mention to Raj, hey, slow down. We'll talk in just a second about uh, voice commands, the voice commands that I use. Now, a left turn is exactly the opposite. I'm essentially cutting the corner, so I have a shorter distance to travel, uh, and he has a longer distance to travel, so the opposite is true. I need to slow down, he needs to speed up, and again, I usually try for both. Um, so that's just a little bit of information that uh, you may not encounter until you, you're getting a little bit more familiar uh, with biking with your dog, and I wanted to make sure to mention that so when it pops up, uh, you're not surprised by that. So invariably, at some point, Usually when you're getting started, you're going to run into a situation where the dog is going to go on the other side of an obstacle. Uh, best example is a tree, okay? Now, um, I have a specific command to try and let them know that I want them to avoid that, and we'll talk about that also in the next section on my verbal commands. Uh, but if it doesn't happen, do not stress it. It's actually a really interesting physics. I didn't even think of it until it actually happened to me, but here's what will happen. You're biking along and the dog doesn't realize that they're going to go on the other side of a tree from you. Uh, what's going to happen is the leash is going to be extended, it's going to catch on the tree, it will pop off your bike handle, I can't do <laughs> pop off your bike handle, and then it's going to hit the tree and wrap around the tree. The physics of the fact that the handle of the leash is moving forward at a pretty good speed, and then what happens is the tree becomes essentially a fulcrum, and the leash will just wrap around the tree maybe a couple of times, and the dog will stop because they're going to realize that they're attached to the tree. You're going to slow down, turn around, go back, and grab the leash unwrap it from the tree and you're good to go. So it's not really that big of a uh, nightmare to have that happen. Again, as long as you have your hands on the handlebars, everything should be fine. Dog's not going to get hurt uh, and you should be okay as well. So in the last two sections, I mentioned that the verbal command section was next. <laughs> so now here it is. Um, so I have a very specific set of verbal commands that I use while I am biking with Rogers. Uh, first of those is this side. Uh, and what that means is that he is too far away from me on you know, what this essentially be my um, Y axis as I'm looking down. And I want him to come back next to me so that as an object coming towards us and I want him to be on this side of it. Um, and those objects most of the time are trees and people. You might have people walking along the side of the trail. Um, and you 
on this side of you and you want obviously the dog to be with you as you go past them or a tree and that is the other big object there so uh, the other uh, corresponding uh, command that I use is with me which is essentially heal uh, but when I say with me I'm generally using it because he is either lagging behind or too far ahead uh, so uh, say with me meaning that now I want him to return to me on this axis um, as I'm looking down my x-axis there I have those wrong <laughs> as I'm looking down this would be the y-axis and this would be the x-axis so uh, reverse those um, and then the other two commands that I use are left turn and right turn and that is used to give the dog an idea that, hey, coming up, I am going to be turning, obviously, either left or right, so prepare for that. Uh, and he does actually now know, when I say right turn, that we're going to be heading in this direction. So uh, definitely very useful to give him a heads up that, hey, I'm going to be you know, turning the bike in front of you, or uh, I'm going to be turning the bike away from you, and you're going to need to keep up. So uh, I try to use those verbal commands specifically with the bike and not uh, using them in other situations so that it's very, very, very clear uh, why I'm using them and that I'm using them to mean that specific thing and there's no confusion. Um, if you use commands in other situations, it might lead him to thinking that it might mean something else. So I specifically use the this side with me and left turn, right turn only while I'm biking. So now as we're wrapping up the video, I just wanna reiterate something that I did mention in the first part of this video, but is uh, good to repeat. And that is start off slow. Like anytime you're teaching a dog something, it needs to be fun for them so that they'll come back and wanna do it again. So start off in small increments and when you're done, congratulate the dog give them a bunch of positive feedback maybe give them a treat uh, and they'll want to come back and do it again but don't have sessions that are too long uh, and a lot of times it can be too much for a dog to process so you want to start in small chunks and then build up from there along that same line start off somewhere where it's going to be easy for the dog to learn so what do I mean by that I mean uh, a mixed-use trail it's quite wide, doesn't have a lot of obstacles along the side, and it isn't very busy. So as an example, I use a mixed use trail that's between two lakes by my house. Uh, there aren't any car crossings or vehicles, and it's through an old railroad cut. So there's the trail, and then a bunch of grass, and then trees, and it's probably about 40 yards wide in most areas, maybe 10 to 15 yards wide in others. So that was a great place for Raj to learn to bike, and I did it primarily during the work day when there weren't a ton of people there. Now you notice in the video that I'm gonna show in a bit that I'm on a path with a lot of traffic. I did that on purpose because I wanted to be able to show a bunch of different scenarios. So don't think that that's the <laughs> ideal scenario to start out with. That would be for an advanced dog. Uh, so start out someplace that's quiet, uh, not a lot of uh, uh, obstacles along the edge and is a wide, nice trail. And then lastly, you'll probably have noticed that I haven't made any mention of biking on a roadway and that was very conscious. You can do it with a dog, it's just not really a great idea. Uh, even on uh, quieter side streets um, in, in a city, there's just a lot going on for the dog to process. So if you're on a quiet, you know, city side street, biking along, there's usually cars parked along each side. Uh, one of the hardest things is that you can't see dogs on the other side of the cars. You can only see the heads of people. And however, the dog knows that there's a dog over there. Uh, they have senses that we don't have and they know that they're there. So I'll, uh, I have tried it and I 
don't recommend it. I do not do it now. Now I walk to my mixed use trail with the dog on the sidewalk uh, and then we start biking from there. So again, it, while you think it might be easy on a quiet uh, city street, it's just not quite as, as uh, simple as that. There are too many things going on. And then lastly, it's always, I always look at the ultimate downside. The ultimate downside of biking on a street with a dog is that either you or the dog get hit by a car. And that is a downside that you just can't accept that risk. So do not recommend it. Um, Kind of counterintuitively, the, the one type of street where it has been easier to bike is actually um, a, a, a limited access highway with a shoulder, um, a four lane highway that has a, a shoulder and then a ditch next to it was easier because there aren't a lot of distractions for the dog and uh, there's a lot more space than on a city or suburban street. Uh, but the one time that I did that, I just felt way too dangerous and nothing bad ultimately happened but you've got cars going by you at 65 75 85 miles an hour and again the ultimate downside is you and your dog get squished by a car going 65 miles an hour both of you are dead so again i have tried it once and i do not do it uh, anymore so i would just skip it that is my recommendation. Uh, stick to the paths, stick to the trails, stick to fields, areas where you don't have a lot of danger. That wraps up the instructive portion. I'm gonna show you some footage of me and Rogers actually out now biking, and I will have some commentary along with that. And uh, after that, we'll wrap up the episode. Thanks so much for watching. Hey, one little safety note I noticed from part one of this video. When I showed you how to make this wire piece to hang off the end of your handlebar, uh, I told you to bend the ends so that there wasn't a sharp protruding uh, end. And that is absolutely correct. But if you'll notice, I bent this in uh, to the inside so that possible that when the carabiner pops off it might catch on this uh, i don't think it would uh, but just in case it's a super easy fix all you have to do is bend the hook around so that this bent end is pointing away from your hook so then when you have this on there and it slides off, it's just gonna slip right off. It's nothing to catch on. So I just wanted to note that so that I didn't have any problems. Now, the first thing that I want to point out in this clip is that as we are biking, we are biking against the traffic that is on the left hand side of us and that means then that Rogers is on my right hand side so I am between him and the traffic. There is another lake nearby where you bike the same direction as the traffic so if you can vision that he would then be on my right hand side and uh, he would be between me and the cars. And I specifically pick this lake to bike around because I like the fact that I am between him and that traffic. So uh, just a quick pointer to say, uh, always be thinking about the location in which you're biking so that you can make sure that your dog is as safe as possible. So I start out by making sure Raj is hydrated. Always make sure to hydrate your dog, especially on a hot day. And then as we get going, I know that Raj has a tendency to start out pretty quickly, so he does that. And there are people on the right-hand side, but I don't see any dogs or food, so I don't grab the leash. And then I also know that he has a tendency to stop pretty quickly after we start so he does that right there and then we get started again
Now, as soon as we get started again, I grab the leash right here, and you cannot see the dog that is approaching, uh, but once we start action back up again, you will be able to see the dog on the right-hand side right there. Now, that dog is a fair distance away, um, and there are some days where Raj will react to a dog that, that is that far away, and there are some days where he won't. Uh, on this day, he did not. Um, so I did grab the actual leash in that instance because I wasn't quite sure how reactive he was going to be on this day. Uh, he did not react at all, so uh, I then was able to let it go and we could continue. Now I again reach down and uh, grab, but this time I grab just the tape. There is a small dog that is on that yellow inflatable that you can see off to the right. Um, it's also underneath a hammock. I don't know if you can tell that that's a hammock hanging from the tree there, but there is a small dog on that inflatable. So because he didn't react to the dog that was further away, I didn't think that I needed to grab the actual leash, so I just grabbed the tape, and uh, that is correct. As we get started again, you will see that he does not react to that dog either. Now this one is pretty interesting. I grabbed the leash here because I could tell from Raj's demeanor that he remembered as we were approaching the puddles on the right hand side that there had been ducks in those puddles the day before. Now he's a pointer, he will point a bird that is sitting still, but if a bird moves he's going to chase it and ducks are pretty flighty so as we approach they invariably will take off so I didn't want him to chase after any ducks. Now I hold on to the leash as we go past all of the puddles just in case there are any ducks that I can't see. Now one thing you will notice after that is I continue to hold onto the leash. Now the reason for this is that after we get past the puddles I notice that there are two people approaching on our right hand side. Now normally I would use the this side verbal command that I mentioned before to get him to come back to me uh, so that we did not have the people pass between us but we don't have enough time for me to be certain that he's going to do that so I hold on to the leash just to make sure that he does come back which he does. So I again grabbed the leash here because of potential duck sighting. We are approaching a spot where ducks like to hang out and there is a ton of duck scent. So it is often the case that he will walk across the path and because the pedestrian path is right next to us at this point, uh, he would then block the entire pedestrian path. So I like to hold on to the leash just to make sure that he doesn't wander over there. And this is also a spot where he likes to stop. And so uh, we take that opportunity to give him a little bit of water on this hot day. Now we have a stretch where not much happens, not too many obstacles, just some people passing us on the left and people walking on the path on the right without dogs. So we make some pretty good time.
now we get to a portion of the path where there are lots of squirrels and I know that he often likes to stop here to give the squirrels a sniff so I'm ready when he stops and then as we get going again because we just stopped I use verbal commands to keep him going. Now this was by far the biggest test on this ride. I grabbed the leash because there is a dog right on the edge of the path and I slowed down just to make sure in case he wants to engage with the dog but he doesn't and we pass without incident. Now here Raj stops somewhere where it's not typical for him to stop and this is a good place to point out that as you're learning to bike with your dog you will start to get to know the different signs that your dog will give as they're preparing to stop. So because I'm really familiar with uh, Roger's signs I was able to stop without the leash popping off of the wire. Now here we are about to pass some people lying on the grass and I can see that they don't have a dog or any food so I don't grab the leash but then I notice that the single person sitting by the bicycle off to the right has a sandwich and even though Raj isn't super food motivated I grab the leash just to make sure that he doesn't go after the sandwich. And that wraps up the ride along section of the video. The last two clips I will leave you with are video I took of the leash popping off of the wire hook. I wanted uh, just to show how easily that happens. And with that, we will say thanks again for watching. Like and subscribe and all that if you want to keep up with Crazy Uncle Fleek and his crazy dogs. And we will catch you next time.